Bright Ideas from the Green Chair spotlights Central Wisconsin and the breakthroughs, innovations, and inspirations that make our state a very special place. This program is dedicated to Bob Williams, a lifelong Central Wisconsin resident. From his public relations office in Stevens Point, Bob's bright ideas moved across the geographic, ethnic, economic, cultural, and political landscapes. His genius helped to elect a governor, build businesses, grow medical research, improve patient care, nurture a university, guard the environment, and inspire many to achieve their fullest potential. Like the fast-moving rivers of central Wisconsin, Bob Williams was uninhibited in his presentation of ideas, large and small. This despite a lifelong battle with debilitating polio that while limiting his physical abilities, never diminished his will to move Wisconsin ever forward. From a well-worn green leather chair in Bob's office, Wisconsin Innovation was created in partnership with some of the state's most respected leaders in politics, business, education, and health care. Prior to his passing, Bob gave his storied green chair to longtime friend, business leader, and philanthropist John Noel, residing now in John's home office along the Wisconsin River just outside of Stevens Point. The green chair welcomes yet another generation of bright ideas, high ideals, and strong spirit. Hello, I'm John Lobbs with Wisconsin Eye with another edition of Bright Ideas from the Green Chair from the home of John and Patty Noel in Plover, Wisconsin. With us today is Dr. Susan Turney, the Chief Executive Officer of Marshfield Clinic Health Systems in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Dr. Turney is a Wisconsin native, a doctor of internal medicine, and a four-year veteran CEO at Marshfield Clinic. She is a Wisconsin success story. Welcome to the Green Chair, Dr. Turney. Thank you. You were born in Mellon, Wisconsin. Tell us about growing up. What was it like growing up in rural Wisconsin? You know, yeah, I was born in Mellon, Wisconsin, and what a great place to be from. It's a very small community, less than 1,000 people. Both my parents were from Mellon, so we have a long history in the community. I grew up in a large Irish Catholic family. I was the oldest child. And uh, I couldn't think of a better childhood and a better place to have been raised. I, I didn't venture too far for college. I went to Northland College in National Wisconsin after two years in Eau Claire, graduated from Northland College after an unsuccessful career as a music major and decided I needed to do something else and decided I wanted to go to medical school. What was it that made you decide to go to medical school? You know, it was really interesting because um, I didn't have anyone in the healthcare profession in my family. And really, the only physician that I knew was the doctor that made house calls for our family. However, I was in uh, kindergarten at the time in Mellon, and the kindergarten teacher had gone around the room and asked everybody, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, people were, were telling her what they wanted to be, and I said, well, I want to be a doctor. And she looked at me like, sure, right, you're going to be a doctor. And so, of course, at that time, I had no idea what it meant. And actually, although I had that in the back of my head, going into medicine was a calling, I also loved music. So I started out in music, but I quickly turned uh, to the sciences, realizing that my passion was around patient care. And again, still not knowing what it meant, uh, I did go to medical school, came back to Marshfield, actually, to do my residency. And it was after I started practice that I had a surprise visitor in the emergency room one night and it happened to be my kindergarten teacher. I ended up caring for her at the end of her life and she and I talked. She was very proud of what I had accomplished and I guess the end of the story is that I guess women can be physicians and can be successful. What a wonderful story from Mellon. You practiced for 22 years at the Marshfield Clinic but then you went into administration. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you went into association work centered around mm -hmm. uh, the medical care system. Uh, tell us about that transition. As a physician, you're always a physician. The passion of everything I've done in my career is around patient care. When I was in um, direct patient care full time, 
Uh, I was also involved in education research, things that were going to help uh, promote the best services that we could do for our patients. However, I really liked uh, physician leadership and roles in the clinic administration, partly because the bigger picture sometimes can have a greater impact than taking care of patients on an individual basis. So I did that for 22 years and then had an opportunity to uh, become the CEO of the Wisconsin Medical Society, which was just a tremendous experience in really understanding the Wisconsin landscape, how care is provided across this great state, and meeting many physicians and physician leaders as well as administrators across the state, really um, trying to do what's best. After that, I served as the Chief Executive Officer of Medical Group Management Association, which is a national organization. And through that opportunity, um, not only did I have the Wisconsin experience, I then had an opportunity to visit every state actually and see what was happening in the healthcare landscape. So the opportunity to really diversify my experiences and to really understand what was going on uh, in many areas of the country, uh, and we certainly found out that healthcare is local, I, I realized that um, I could put my skills to good use. So when the health system was created in 2012 and they started searching for a CEO of Marshall Clinic Health System, and I had an opportunity to apply for the job and then subsequently get the job, I was thrilled to come back home and really serve my communities in Wisconsin. Is there something about rural Wisconsin that draws you back? You know, I love rural Wisconsin. I've lived in big cities and they have a lot of great opportunities. But when I think about who I am at my heart, it, it, it's about patient care. And my family and friends uh, have been in Wisconsin for uh, decades. And I had a I never lost my um, interest in Marshall Clinic. Even though I was gone for 10 years, I knew things that Marshall Clinic was doing were special. The patient was first. We really uh, had been enriching the lives of our communities for decades. And we had a long history of innovation where we could provide care when patients wanted it, how they wanted it, and where they wanted it. So I thought, what a great opportunity to uh, look to the future and help create uh, the next iteration of what Marshfield Clinic needs to look like. Marshfield Clinic uh, um, serves a rural area. You're from a rural area, you've got, you've got it in your roots. Um, what, are, what are some of the challenges you face serving a rural population in Wisconsin? Well, first my challenges are living up to my family's expectations because they're all around me. And that's a huge challenge, especially my mother. But I have to say that uh, the communities that we serve are the communities that my family is living in. And they tend to be um, uh, poorer families. They tend to be older uh, and they also uh, tend to be sicker. And I'll explain that. We know that the average household income for Wisconsin is about $66,000 for a family of four. Yet in the communities that we serve in the northern half of the state, the average household income is about $42,000. And we also know that there's a difference, uh, eco there's different economy across the state of Wisconsin. When we look at the aging of our population, in Madison, uh, the Fox Valley, other places of the state, we have four to five people who are working for every Medicare patient. So for every Medicare patient there are four to, uh, who is over 65, there are four or five people working. And in the counties that we serve, there are counties where we have less than two people working for every Medicare beneficiary. That's great. That's who we serve. The issue is that you just don't have that base of commercial patients to help offset uh, the cost of taking care of our wonderful Medicare patients. So we, um, again, we serve a poor, a sicker, and an older population, and we do it well. So that's one, uh, that's the demographic that creates challenges, but also people live in very rural area. They live very remotely. We have places where our patients don't have access to the internet. Sometimes they have to drive an hour, hour and a half to get care, even though we have with our medical practices and our dental clinics over 60 sites. So we, we have to always think about that when we're uh, uh, strategizing our plans for how we deliver care to our patients is who are they, where do they live, and how can we best serve them? What are some of the things that, that you're doing to address 
uh, these kinds of problems uh, uh, for that population, for, uh, for, for those who have to travel uh, miles and miles. Uh, what, what sort of special things are you doing? You know, it's really interesting because one wouldn't think that Marshall Clinic Health System was a pioneer in uh, telehealth, but we were over 20 years ago, actually uh, with Tommy Thompson and Sue Ann Thompson, who helped uh, us uh, uh, ignite the telehealth world. And why is that important? It's important because you can't have specialists, especially quaternary or tertiary specialists, people that do um, uh, care uh, need to have a volume where they can do it and they need to have the support system around it to make sure that care can be delivered. And we can't do that at every place where we have a clinic or hospital. So some of our bigger centers have more specialists than others, but people need access to those physicians and other providers. So having the telehealth capability has allowed us to do that. Telehealth is really um, one clinic site to another site, bringing the patient to the physician who then communicates with another physician electronically. And that's been very helpful for our patients because that means they can get uh, some insight about their disease, some idea about what they might expect as they go forward without having to make the trip. I mean, when people have to think about missing work, getting childcare, filling up their uh, car with, a, uh, with uh, gas, those are huge challenges financially before they even get in the door of our facility. But there are other things that we're doing. Recently we've launched an app that allows patients on their mobile devices to connect with a nurse practitioner. Uh, some of our uh, insurance companies have a plan design that patients can access that for as part of their coverage, but other people will pay out of pocket and it's $40 for a visit. And I mean, you think of the time it saves and the money it saves for someone to get access to great care, not only get a diagnosis, get their treatment, have the medication sent to them directly without you know, leaving their home, they can be in their jammies. So those are things that we've been doing to really uh, meet our patient needs, uh, considering our geography and the patient population that we serve. Uh, one of the, the, to personalize this a bit for myself, uh, one of the things that I've liked recently as a patient uh, is the ability to communicate with my doctor uh, uh, on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, um, to, to send a message uh, to his portal that says, oh my gosh, I have a little uh, uh, swelling in my wrist, I have some water. Mm -hmm. And he responds and says, well, how about if we do just a little uh, water pill, a, a little diuretic? Mm -hmm. And uh, he prescribes it, and I go get it, and it works. And I did it with, by just for asking for advice. I did it on the internet. It didn't cost me anything. Mm -hmm. uh, yet there is a statistic that says only 25% of people that live in rural America have access to high-speed internet. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to be um, one of those people. I have that access. But what about 20 miles outside of Park Falls? We know the challenges of our patient population. Certainly not everyone has high-speed internet. But we do have the capability of having patients come into one of our sites that may be a small family medicine practice in Ladysmith or uh, our practice in, in Park Falls. And patients can come there and then connect with their physician if they don't happen to be at that site through our telehealth capabilities. The, um, but having uh, phone access, which most people have a mobile phone right now, and text messaging capabilities, we find that people are able to, to reach their physician and reach their caregivers so that they can ask the questions without having to wait through the process of calling someone and waiting for a return call when they might be at work and uh, get the information that they need, it, you know, pretty close to real time, actually. Are you doing anything? I know this is outside the... Um... Uh, the healthcare um, uh, realm, mm -hmm. but are you doing anything um, as, a, uh, as a business, as an entity to try to encourage that internet access, that broadband access? We've been very active in working with um, 
both um, coalitions across the state as well as our legislature about promoting uh, broadband capabilities across the state. And certainly most of that is in our service area where there's probably the biggest deficit. So it is very important to us. It's not important to us just from a healthcare perspective. It's also important from a commerce business perspective as well. So yeah, this is very important to us and something we are advocating for very strongly. Um, let me let me switch gears here uh, just a little bit. Um, Stan Healthcare, it's a big business. It's a big money business, dollar business in the United States. Um, Marshfield Clinic is classified as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, yet you still have to uh, bring in the money so you can keep the enterprise going. So. What are some of the advantages of being a nonprofit? And what sort of disadvantages do you face as a nonprofit trying to uh, stay above water? You know, the advantage of our being nonprofit is not having to be beholden to shareholders, yet, we, um, we are a big business and we do need to make sure that we can keep the lights on. It's extremely important to be there for our patients. I think that um, being able to live our mission is critical. And that's easy for those of us who have worked in the organization a long time. Enriching lives is easy in the concept. It's just making sure you deliver on that promise. So I would say that the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages that we can see. Um, I think the strength of our organization is really the fact that um, we are innovative. We've been uh, promoting education and research for decades. We've created a health plan all of which are building blocks in helping us meet our mission. What, what is the uh, Marshall Clinic doing to try to help contain the costs of healthcare? You know, affordability is top of mind for us and for our patients, as well as employers, as a matter of fact. Um, there was a recent study done by a university outside of the state of Wisconsin that surveyed patients, employers, and physicians and said, what is top of mind for you? And I think most of us would think that for patients, their outcomes and their health were top priority, but affordability was their top priority. And I think it comes as no surprise as people have, uh, are, have more financial risk. They have bigger out-of-pocket expenses than they've ever had. But practices also are exposed during, with that risk because they're now having to work more closely with patients and their families uh, because of the fact that they have that financial risk uh, where that was not as common in the past. So the affordability is top of mind and for four years that's been one of our uh, strategic imperatives is to really look at how we can provide the best value at the lowest cost. And we've been able to deliver on that, which to me is very exciting. And I'll give you a couple of examples because I think they're important. We all know that hospital care, acute care is very expensive. And we also know that acute care is necessary. If you've had major trauma, need to be in, in an emergency room, have to be in an intensive care unit, you want that care in a good hospital that can provide the best services for you. But there are many things that can be done outside of the hospital, and in fact, outside of the clinic, that can help lower the cost of care. I'll give you uh, just two examples, actually. Um, a couple of years ago, we were not in the acute care space as much as we are today, since just about a year ago, we acquired a major hospital in Marshfield from Ascension. Having said that, we knew that there were many cases, surgical cases that were being done in the hospital that could easily be moved to what we call ambulatory setting. They could be done in an ambulatory surgical center. The problem is, is that there are restrictions on how long a patient can recover after they've had a procedure, and it's 24 hours. We, we know that cases could be moved if they could extend the recovery beyond that period. So what we did is we partnered with Grace Lutheran Services to build skilled nursing facilities, contracted with Security Health Plan, which is our health plan, as well as other insurance companies to bundle payment so we could do the procedure and have the patient recover in a lower cost setting. The fantastic news about this is patients love it. We're doing very complex cases in the ambulatory surgery center and have been actually recognized nationally for the good care we provide in the ASC as well as the patient experience and outcomes 
uh, patients, 98% of the patients are extremely satisfied with the service. But the most important thing, which is the question you asked, is what did it do about the cost of care? And it actually overall has lowered the cost of those services by more than 25%. And that includes the out-of-pocket cost for the patient with their co-pays and deductibles. So that's like a win-win-win. It's a win for the patient and families, actually, because they get great care, great outcome, less cost for the payer, and the providers are extremely happy in that environment, um, knowing that they're best serving the patient, not just around their outcome, but around the cost. And then another example of what we've done, which is um, innovative, although it's been done in other countries, is our uh, home recovery care, which is really a hospital at home program. We instituted that program two years ago and when patients would come to the clinic, the urgent care or the hospital emergency room with a condition that would normally be where they would normally be admitted to the hospital, we're actually looking at uh, specific criteria about their condition and deciding if they can be managed at home or if they need to be in the hospital. So we're actually taking patients who would be hospitalized, having their care in the home the same level of care that they would get in the hospital, yet it's with their family in their home. They're not having to have their family travel to visit as they receive their care. Extreme satisfaction by the patients and family. Again, 98% satisfaction. The same or better outcomes than what you see in a hospital. And again, at a lower cost. Patients are saving money, payers are saving money. It's really, these have been two huge success stories, but we're continuing to um, also look at how we manage our population. We know that we don't take care of everybody every year, and we also know that we don't take care of everybody just in the four walls of our facilities, that uh, health and health care extends across one's continuum of life. And certainly, population health is a tool that we have where we can identify um, gaps in care, we can identify um, people with chronic diseases that need to be better managed and uh, so we know you know who has received their immunizations we can alert them that they need to come in and have those taken care of we can alert them that they've not received the appropriate screening health care like colonoscopies and mammograms and we also know that by managing diseases like diabetes and hypertension we can prevent complications uh, heart, heart attacks strokes um, kidney problems so when we instituted this program about 15 years ago, less than 50% of our patients with high blood pressure were adequately controlled. However, at this point in time, nearly 90% of the patients with that diagnosis are controlled. So not only do people have better quality of life, we know we can mitigate complications by making sure that they're getting adequately treated. So that's, again, a very, very exciting. It's a win for the patient, it's a win for the payer, and it's certainly a win for the provider. It's interesting you talk about interactions with the patients. What about a broader sense? How can healthcare organizations uh, uh, partner with their communities and, um, uh, and, and make their presence better known? We have been uh, strong advocates and have always worked with community resource to help our patients. Again, you know, when you think about the average patient, they have um, a few office visits for their medical conditions uh, unless something, you know, acute happens. So they're in an office maybe 15, 20 minutes, three or four times a year. That is not where they receive most of their care. They receive most of their care at home and in their community. So uh, one of the things that we've done uh, recently is uh, partner with the YMC in Marshfield. And that's been um, uh, a very exciting opportunity for us. Patients can go to the Y without having out-of-pocket expense to get nutrition counseling. They can get exercise programs. They're able to get some of their behavioral health needs addressed. It's just really exciting to be able to partner with those who are already in the community, leverage the best things that we both can do in an environment that's safe and, uh, again, will pay up dividends because it results in better patient compliance and better patient care. At the start of our little sit-down here, you talked about uh, coming back to Marshfield to, to help with the future development of the clinic. Uh, let me go broader than that. Um, 
What is your vision for the future of healthcare, say 20 years from now? Healthcare 2040 <laughs> by Dr. Turney. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if there was no healthcare because we had solved all of the issues for our patients and their families through prevention, screening, managing chronic illnesses. But there will always be some need for health care, and we realize that. But as we think about the technology advances that are here today and will only improve over time, uh, I think the one thing we need to always remember is that health care is not just technology, and it's not just a human touch. It's an and. We need to leverage the use of technology to facilitate relationships across geographies. We need to be able to lower the cost of care by looking at alternative sites of service. And we need to continue to improve ways that we communicate with people to make sure that they're getting what they need, prevention, getting their screening exams, and making sure that we really do manage their chronic illnesses. And the last thing I'd say about this is certainly genomics is in the press everywhere these days. And really targeting the personalized situation around a patient and the unique needs that they have is going to explode over time. So I think um, healthcare is gonna look very different in the next 20 years, um, but there will be pieces of it that will be familiar, and that's the human touch and the use of technology to really advance what we do. Dr. Turney, your ideas are certainly worthy of the green chair. Thank you for joining us uh, for this edition of Bright Ideas from the Green Chair. I'm John Lobbs for Wisconsin Eye, and I hope you look forward, as I do, to the next edition of Bright Ideas from the Green Chair.